It's graduation Sunday. We're recognizing our graduates. No, they're not here, but we're, we're recognizing them anyway. We've got Abby West, Gabe Jenkins, Serena Epperson, Kendall Foltz, and Pre Patrice Dalton. We are so proud of every single one of you. Uh, I, I wish, thank you, yes, clap. Yeah, I, hope it, I hope at home you're clapping right now. You better be clapping. If not, then may God judge you. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've got these graduates, and every year, you know, last year we didn't have so many, uh, but the year before that we had, what, seven graduates? Now we've got uh, five graduates, and uh, it's always a little heartbreaking for me as a youth pastor when someone graduates, because I know there's a limited amount of time that I have left to spend with them, unless you're Lily Conley, and she can't, we can't seem to get rid of her for some reason. But people graduate, and then they go, Right? And I, I get to have these conversations with teenagers before they graduate. And uh, it, it's almost like gallows humor. Like when, as a senior starts to get closer to the stage or closer to that new part of their life, whether that's college or they're going to do whatever, if they're going to go straight into the work field, there's still this feeling that I get from the kids like they're being asked to walk the plank, right? And then I talk to parents who have graduates. Mr. Sean West, your daughter is going to graduate soon. And uh, there's almost a sensation from the parents that they are uh, pushing the broom that is pushing that child off the plank, right? Uh, I had a conversation maybe three years ago in San Antonio, and uh, this parent was talking about the, the stress he felt that his kid was graduating. And he said, Daniel, it's not like I don't trust him, but, but here's the deal. You know, one time I went out and I, I came back, uh, I said, hey, you can feed yourself. You know, you're, you're a big boy now. You're uh, 17 years old. Go ahead and put yourself a, a frozen pizza into the oven and, you know, take care of yourself. You got this, man. You've cooked before. But when Dad got back, he, he found his kid eating the pizza, which is great. But there were three burnt ones in the trash. And that's when Dad looked at me and said, I think he's going to die out there. I think he's going to starve to death, Daniel. I don't think he's going to make it. Um, I get the concerns. So I've picked out a story this morning that we all know, we're all very familiar with it, about the underdog, okay? And I'm going to try to convince you, while you may be familiar uh, with the story, I'm going to convince you there's more in this that maybe you haven't thought about before. And I'm going to try to convince you that the story of David and Goliath, that's 1 Samuel chapter 17, is in no way an underdog story. The only way it's an under underdog story is if we have misunderstood the text. Are you guys with me? I hope you've got your Bibles out. We're going to start at chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, uh, verse 1. And I'm going to read, and I'm going to read a lot, but I'm going to stop and park on the things I want you to notice. You guys ready? Thank you. Verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered there in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes, uh, Demimim, between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. So you've got these two armies. You've got the Philistines and you've got the Israelites, and they're both on two hills. If your translation may say mountain, usually, guys, if you see the word mountain in the Bible, it's just a hill. It's a big hill. And that valley between them, the Valley of Elah, that exists today. You can go there. There's a stream that runs through it. You can pick up stones from the stream and pretend it's the one that David used to, to kill Goliath. You can go there now. But for whatever reason, you've got an army on one hill and an army on another, and the Philistines have been a pain in the side of Israel for so long. And they're going to meet somewhere in the middle. Now, I can't tell you exactly why. They didn't just rush down. I don't know why this chapter didn't start with. And they met with sword and bone and clashing at the bottom of the hill. Maybe it's possible that whoever rushes first loses the advantage, right? Because if you rush down a hill, now you've lost the elevation. But for whatever reason, you've got these two armies standing off, and they are all, all dressed and prepared for war. In a lot of ways, what we've been doing for our graduates, uh, parents, friends of parents, aunts, uncles, extended family, church members, has been trying to dress up our children to go out there and fight. And yet we get here to this scene... And we're all prepared, and I wonder if the Israelites and the Philistines are starting to get amped. I wonder if they're starting to beat on their chest plate. I wonder if there's a war cry that goes up. I, I, they're, they're ready to fight when all of a sudden this happens. We're at verse uh, 4. 
a champion named Goliath who was from Gath came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves. A bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. And can, who wants to be, you know, the shield bearer of Goliath, you know, carrying that thing, trying to sweat in front of him? But you look at Goliath and you have to realize something. He's a giant. He's, he's a big, he's a big man. I, I, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sorry I keep picking on you, Sean. I bet Sean would give anything for a nine and a half foot tall uh, junior for the Lady Braves. Wouldn't you take a nine foot tall girl on the t- girl? I, not because they can dunk without going on their tippy toes, but because no one wants to. <laughs> how do you post up against that? What do you do? What do you do? This guy's huge. He's massive. He is a big problem. And I'm telling you, guys, parents, as we get our kids ready for war and we start strapping them into stuff, at some point we have to understand that our children, you guys, you graduates, you're going to go out and you're going to meet a problem that we did not equip you for. You're going to meet a problem where there's no tangible, no physical way to approach the issue. He says, let me find this verse real quick. Let me read this. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat. He wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. That's about 125 pounds. I don't like to carry 125 pounds with my arm. He's wearing it as a t-shirt. That's like if I was ready for war, I'm ready to do something amazing, and I just picked Jazz up, picked my wife up, and just strapped her to myself, which I guess would be a good, you know, human shield kind of, I'm just, I wouldn't do that to you, but if I was to strap her around my body and then wage war, that's what this guy does. He's wearing a shirt that's the weight of a human male. I had to use jazz because I couldn't offer any other women's, uh, woman's weight on, on This is going on the internet forever, you know, and I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, but he's massive, and he's big. And listen to this. <clears throat> Eight, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for a battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? And I love the language that Goliath is a manipulator. I, you know, he may be big and dumb, but maybe he's a little bit smarter than we're giving him credit for because he uses manipulative language here. He says, aren't I a Philistine and aren't you a servant of a man? Aren't you the servant of a king? Now, the Israelites have this long-standing history of being rescued by God, of being victorious because of God. They've got a long-standing history of walking out of Egypt with all the riches and walking through the sea and the, stone, the walls of Jericho tumbling to the ground. And I'm, I'm telling you, you, you read only just a little bit before this and you, re, you find out the Philistines remember Egypt. The enemy, Goliath from Gath, he knew the story. He knew that the Hebrew God came in and gave them victory. But he doesn't say, hey, aren't I a Philistine and you a child of God? No, he says, aren't I a Philistine and you a man? He wants to separate the, the Israelites from God. And he does it with his language. And I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, you know from talking to me, graduates, look at my eyes. You know from talking to me that you are a child of God. I, I pray that your parents communi- communicate that to you. I, I pray that you understand that there is no separating force that is great enough to divide you from God, as, as Parker was sharing in his meditation. He wants to be with you. It's not in his will to let you go like that. And yet it is the language of the enemy to remove you from God or make you think that you're removed from God and call you a servant of, the man, of man, a servant of the world. You are not a servant of the world. You're not. And no victory comes from being a servant of the world, and the enemy knows that, and the enemy is going to do everything he can from yesterday to the rest of your life to remind you that you are sinful and that you have an impermanent place on this earth and that you are very small compared to a nine-foot man You are a very, very small person, whoever you are, whoever's listening to this. We go forward. I'm going to do 10 again. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. 
On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So Goliath has this plan to say, hey, we can duke this out right now. We can cover the valley of Elah in blood and guts. We can do that, or we can just do this mano y mano, hand-to-hand combat. One, one of me versus one of you. I'm this big. Send me someone you think can fight. Now, the interesting fact here is that on one hill, of course, you've got the Philistines, and on the other hill, you've got the Israelites. Well, the tallest man of the Israelites was who? Some, I'm sure one of y'all knows it. Shout it out. Who was the tallest man that day that was an Israelite? It was Saul. King Saul, the man leading this army, is the tallest person, right? The only physical attribute you really have is that he looks good and he's real tall. He looks like a king. In fact, when the, when the Israelites asked Samuel for a king, and he said, why, why do you think, why do you want one of the, for what? We have a king. For what? What do you need a king for? The answer was so that he could lead us into battle. And here's Saul's moment, guys. Here it is. Big, tall Saul against big, tall, because, you know, Saul is impressive height, right? Goliath is upsetting height. Okay, it's, that's upsetting. He's towering. And it says here that these, the, the Philistines, on hearing the Philistines' word, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. In that second word, you've got dismayed. Everyone say dismayed. And then you've got terrified. Everyone say terrified. terrified. Now, the word they use for terrified here is a word that they use earlier in the text in reference to God. Y'all catch that? that they feel not just a physical fear, but almost a reverence for the danger that is Goliath. In the same way that we should all have this healthy fear of the Lord. In a sense, what's happening right now is that Goliath marching out and saying, I challenge you, has removed their fear of God. God is not even in the equation anymore. And now the kind of fear that should be reserved for the Lord is being handed over to Goliath, the big man with the big mouth standing, in the bottom of the, standing on the hill. Now he gets respect. Why? Well, because he's big. Don't you do that? Because here's the truth of why they're dismayed and terrified. Because they're looking at this problem. If this was an equation, it's the problem versus me. Right? It's nine and a half versus five eleven. That's the way they're looking at it. And because of that language that the Philistine uses, this uncircumcised Philistine Goliath, because he comes out and says, aren't you just a man? Don't come at me as an army united. Come at me one-on-one. Then they're forced to think about themselves as one. As one. Not one in God. Not one in in the fellow believers. Not one in the people of the church. One. And we're in this situation where I feel like there are ways the enemy has convinced us that the coronavirus, as we're all split up, is making us one. We are not effective warriors when we think of ourselves that way, are we? We quail under the shadow of even the smallest problem when it's us alone versus that problem. And you know they're, 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 they're looking over at that guy and they're saying, okay, I know what he looks like, I know what I look like. It ain't gonna work. That equation doesn't make any sense. I do not equal that. Or that is greater than I am. That's how it's gonna plan. And you know what? That attitude, is that's exactly what keeps them in that spot. That's why no one comes forward. Because the equation doesn't have God in it. The equation doesn't have friends and family in it. The equation for these Philistines, each one, Saul is thinking about himself versus Goliath. And that leadership sets the bar for everyone under him. We go to 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem and Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. The firstborn was Eliab. Everyone say Eliab. The second, Abinadab. Everybody say Abinadab. And the third was Shammah. 
David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And for those of you who may not know, at this point, David, even though this is the story where we think about Saul and David and Goliath, really, this story goes back really far, right? David was actually in the service of Saul in his courts before this battle even took place, right? Which makes it especially weird later when Saul doesn't even recognize David. But David is with his father, and he's going back and forth. He's going from his home to take care of his, uh, whatever his responsibilities are. He is a shepherd for his father. And then he's going to the war front. We go to uh, verse 16. For 40 days, the Philistine, they're talking about Goliath, came forward every morning and every, every evening and took his stand. And this is what I want all of our graduates, if our graduates are paying attention. And if our graduates don't see this, parents, repeat this to them. Because this is huge. We know why they're terrified. We know why they're dismayed. They're dismayed because they're not nine and a half feet tall. They're upset because they don't add up to the problem at hand. They do not measure up. But for 40 days and 40 nights, this Philistine is coming out to remind them of that failure. For 40 days and 40 nights, and we hear this story, it's always the same. I don't, you know, the... the nursery school or the Sunday school version of this is, you know, when the, all the drawn cartoons for it, it, it's always, it never includes the 40 days, does it, right? Uh, David shows up, he's talking to Saul, and then Goliath comes storming out, he says it once, David says, I'll fight him, and then he goes out and wins, and it's great, and it, but there's more to it. For 40 days, Goliath marches out in the morning, calls them wimps, goes back to his tent, comes back right before bedtime, and says, all right, parting thought, you guys are small. So for 40 days, this entire army is living in shame. They are defeated. Has a struck been, has a bl- has a struck been blown? Has, <laughs> has a blow been struck? No. Has a spear been hurled yet? No. But they are defeated. They came equipped for war, but prepared for for defeat. They are defeated. I, I, and I don't want to say it this way. I don't, I don't know how to say it more delicately. Kids, when you graduate and you start going out into the world, you're going to realize many people, many people in this world are defeated. We live in a world full of defeated people. And people treat that defeat, they treat that shame in a variety of ways. And it's almost always Sinful. It's almost always, uh, it's always always something negative. I mean, if you really try to fill the shame that you feel with alcohol, with drugs, with your occupation, with your relationships, you're going to fail. And chances are, you're pursuing it in a way that's going to destroy you. And for 40 days and 40 nights, these people are being woken up and sent to bed with the reminder that they don't add up. And I bet you if you were to stop, graduates, and ask your parents... Ask the older people you respect, has there ever been a season where you have just felt absolutely defeated? They tell you the truth. That we all go through this, don't we? Don't we all lose heart? I mean, do you, is there, did any of you in this room ever go through a season where there was, there was something about you that you disliked? And you were made somehow, you just, the first thing you thought of in the morning was that particular failure, that aspect of your life that you didn't care for. And before you went to bed, as it's quiet, if you're a married person, the person next to you falls asleep and your eyes are awake because you're thinking about all the ways that you don't stack up. That's what's happening here. And you guys are going to go out into the workforce and you're going to see people who, they're not going through that. They just live that. They just stay there. They're perpetually in a place of feeling less than. They're always six, uh, five foot eleven, not quite six, not quite nine, not quite nine and a half, all the time. They just live there. Uh, let's go forward. We're going to go into 17 now. Jesse, no, I'm sorry, that's, that's wrong. Oh, yes, now 17. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. 
Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance uh, from them, which I always think is weird, you know, because, I mean, we know how the story ends, right? David takes a sword and he, well, first is the rock and forehead, yes, but then there's the, the giant Goliath's head, and I'm wondering if he goes back to see Jesse, and Jesse goes, you, okay, did your brothers get the bread? Oh, yes, Dad, they got the bread. You, you give ten cheeses to the commander. They get their cheese? Yes, Dad, they got their cheese. Did you bring any proof that my sons are okay? Yeah, check this out. You know, giant Goliath head. Just, what? I did it, Dad. Uh, so he's sending his son to the battlefront to bring bread. And this is how David ends up in the whole situation to begin with, because he was obedient. Now, if you have studied this book, then you will have known that David has actually been anointed to be the next king after Saul lost his anointing. Y'all with me? Saul was going to be the first. Saul messed up big time. Well, many of it has to do with the qualities that we see in this story. And then David comes in, and David comes to the battlefield, and he's already been anointed. And this is what great's about, what's great about David. Saul's a manipulator. Saul doesn't have a lot of faith, but he puts on a big show. Saul pushes the burden and pushes the blame of everything that happens onto someone else. David doesn't do that. In fact, if we look at this, David, when he was anointed a king, needed to do nothing. He didn't pursue being anointed as the next king. And he didn't pursue making his way to the battlefield. He was told to be there. And it led to victory. And I, I just want you kids to know, you are going to feel pressured to manipulate, to succeed. You're going to feel pressured to put people down so that you can stay up. Like the drowning man, you have to push people beneath you to be at a higher elevation. You're going to be convinced that uh, you do what it takes to become financially acceptable. And maybe when you're financially accept, you know, when you've got enough finances, you can bless someone else. You're going to be convinced by the sin in our world, as broken it is, as it is, that you have to manipulate your way to the top. And here David, throughout almost all of this, through his meteoric rise from shepherd boy to king of Israel, he hardly lifts a finger unless he's told to by an authority figure. And it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. He didn't manipulate his way into being there. He's just, he just trusted. And that trust got him where he needed to be. Don't manipulate. Don't use dirty tricks, okay? Gra graduates, that's my point. That's what I'm getting at. Sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> 20. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd. Loaded up and set out. And I want to point this out. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd. Can you guys remember that? What did he do with the sheep? He left it with a shepherd. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting their war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As, as he was walking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from the lines and shouted the usual defiance. And the only difference between the 39 times— I'm sorry, 39, that's not right. If he did it twice a day for 40 days, give me some math. So— Maybe this is the 80th time itself. 79 other times, David didn't get to hear it, but he heard this one. Isn't God's timing amazing that it would end up being the, the number 40? For those of you that are uh, Bible students, those of you who work scholastically at learning your, your scripture, that's amazing that it turns out the way. And the 40th time he goes out there, and this is now this is the time that David hears it. When the Israelites were at 24, when the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to a man who kills him. He will also give his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. So Saul, naturally, you know, he's not going to go out and fight, but he can buy someone to fight, maybe. But so far, no one has been insane enough to do it, because yes, it's great to not pay taxes, but what good is paying taxes if they have to scrape your ribs off the sidewalk? You know, it doesn't do anyone any good if they, is there a prize for losing a fight with Goliath? Because I'm in, you know, it, it, no one's fought yet. Let's get down to 28. David hears Goliath, and he starts asking around, and he hears about the reward. He hears about the reward for fighting. And then he goes to Eliab. You guys remember, who was Eliab to him? His older brother. It was the oldest brother. He's on the battlefront. Eliad's been there for a couple days now. He's been there for a while, just over a month. And then he hears David 
asking about Goliath. And this is Eliab's response. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? Well, we know why he's down there. He's down there to do what he has been told. And we know what happened with the sheep. I ask you guys to remember that. He made sure that the sheep were taken care of. He took care of all his responsibilities. He came there with the best of intentions. And this is what Eliab says. This is how he replies. And with whom did you leave the sh- those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Well, first of all, in the room, raise your hand if you've got, you've got siblings. Don't they talk to you like this? It's, okay. Um, yeah, we're going to start talking about grace here for a minute. Did David come there to see the blood and gore? Did he neglect his sheep to come watch the blood and gore? No. In, in a second, we're going to see that really, even his intention for fighting Goliath has nothing to do with personal glory. No, he's not there for any of those purposes. And yet, Eliab attacks his character. Eliab uh, plays him down as a child. Eliab's being abusive here. He's being extremely mean-hearted. And any of you parents that have toddlers that are close in age, you know this starts real young. I mean, they start, my gosh. I, Harley says some of the weirdest stuff out of anger to the rest of my kids. I don't know where it comes from. Probably jazz. Um, but Eliab, it just goes on a tear. And I want you to think about this. What has Eliab been putting up with for the last 40 days? Shame. He's part of the same Israelite army that has burdened with knowing that they don't, they don't stack up day after day after day after day. Waking up and going to sleep reminded that they are not enough. Eliab's defeated. He's burnt. And this is how we can expect hurting people to act. We can expect people who are hurting to act this way. And sometimes it's going to be the people you love. Sometimes it's going to be the people you love. Sometimes, you know, we don't even think to ask. We don't think to take a spiritual understanding of what someone in our household might be going through. But we know how they act. Ooh, and does that stir up some emotion, doesn't it? It does. It's very hard to have grace for someone when they're so close to you. Graduates. I hope there's people that are close to you. I know that you're going to go through this weird season where you're away from home, you're away from home base, and you're making all of these surface-level relationships with people that you go to school with. And it's going to be a long time. I pray. I'm praying for Abby. Abby's going to be 45 years old when she gets married, right, Sean? There's going to be a span of time between them leaving the nest and having another nest, having people that they can be close to, right? And my prayer is that you get there quickly. Because those relationships are always the ones worth saving, and it's always the ones worth showing people grace in and understanding, hey, I know you're defeated. I know you feel defeated. I felt it too. I, there are days I wake up and I know I'm not enough, and I know that you're going through that, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and not swing on you today, uh, but tomorrow we'll, we'll see. There, people are hurt all over, guys. People feel defeat. Uh, people that you know and respect, people that you have a disdain for. They all suffer from this. And I want you to know something about this story. To me, this story right now, the telling, the way I'm explaining the story, I want you to understand my focus is not so much David as it is the Israelites. Because David is an exceptional person in this moment. He is absolutely the example of But to know what's good, you have to know what's kind of normal, right? To understand what's exceptional, you have to know where the baseline is. And for us, sometimes we are 98.999% Israelites shivering on a hilltop than we are David climbing down the side of the mountain. And we need to recognize it in ourselves, and we need to recognize it in other people. We're almost done here. I've got one one more note here. Go down to 32. David speaks to Saul, uh, and David says this. This is his reasoning. This is his motivation for fighting, not because, yeah, I want a new wife, and I want to pay taxes. That's not not what he offers. He says, 
In 32, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Why is he fighting Goliath? To strengthen his people. To bring courage and confidence and a reminder that God is with us. I told you, I was telling you this story because I know, graduates, that you're intimidated. Parents, I know that you're intimidated by letting them run free. And I said I was going to read this because it's an underdog story, and maybe some of you at home feel like it's an underdog story. This has never been an underdog story. David and Goliath is not an underdog story. It's an underdog story if you think that David fought Goliath alone. We're going to go back a step. I want you to remember, Goliath refers to the Israelites as servants of who? Servants of Saul. This is what David calls. David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who challenges the armies of God? He walks in, and everyone has been in despair. For 40 days, they've seen defeat. They're waking up to it. They're going to sleep to it. A boy shows up, and he says, who is this idiot? This guy's a moron. Does he know who we are? Do you read this guy a book? Does he watch TV? He doesn't know who we are? We're an army of God, and we are going to win. He sees absolute victory in the moment. So my challenge for you graduates is that when you go out, you are going to be surrounded by people who have lost. You are going to be surrounded by people who are defeated. You are going to be surrounded by people who are emotional and defensive in dealing with a thousand scars and wounds that stack up over the, over the years. And you're going to go in and you're going to see complete victory. I, I, I believe it. I'm praying for it. I think the generation that's being raised up in this church is going to go out there and kill it, pun intended, kill it, cut its head off. I think you guys are going to nail it out there, and I believe in you. And I, I see, I do, I look at our kids and I see victory. And this graduation recognition day, I'm telling you, there is victory coming out of this church when other people despair and see the state of the church in our generation, I think, you've missed it. Because you don't believe God's with us. You feel defeated because you don't believe that God's with us. And it took a young man to make that happen. It took a young man to show up with a completely different perspective. Go down to 34. Saul tells David that he, he's not able to win this fight. David says, I'll go out there. I'm going to bring heart to your people. We're going to be encouraged. And Saul says, no, you're not. You can't do that. Have you seen? You look at him. Look at you. <laughs> look at them. Now look at you. And David says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and carried off his sheep from the flock. I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. The uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. He has not defied Saul's servants. He is defying the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And this is the beautiful part to me. Because here in just a second, what Saul's going to do is Saul's going to do what we do as parents, right? We know our kids going out. We're going to decorate them with every ounce of equipment. Like, who, every firstborn child in every family has more clothes than any other person in existence. Like, when we moved here to, oh my gosh, how is it this cold Kentucky, uh, we had to take our kids outside. And we, have you seen A Christmas Story? I can't put my arms down. That's exactly what it was. Uh, he had boots. He had galoshes. He had thermal underwear. He had a face mask. He had aviator goggles. He had everything. And we would say, all right, now you're ready. And we'd throw him outside, and he would wobble around and fall over. That's what Saul does. That's what we do as parents. You're, oh, you're leaving the house. Okay. I really wish I would taught you how to plunge a toilet. I really, I really wish that I would taught you how to change a tire because I'm convinced that you're going to die because I have not taught you enough. So we say, all right, well, let me dump everything on you. Saul's looking at David and then Goliath and say, whoa, my gosh, how can I make this situation just a little bit easier for him? Okay, I'll put my armor on him. And David's words, and I, oh my gosh, I love this. 
David says, I cannot go in these because I have not used them. He says, I'm not familiar with getting victory by wearing armor. I can't wear this because I haven't tested it. I don't believe this will work. And when Saul tells him earlier, hey, you can't go out and fight Goliath, he says, well, look, I'll tell you what. I fought a bear. I fought a lion. And God gave me both of those. See, I haven't tested your armor, Saul, but I've tested my God. I have a testimony of him bringing me victory. And because I have a testimony of him bringing me victory, I'm going to go out the way I always do. Dress as a shepherd, depending on my God. Worship team, please join us. Come on up. I've decided, I actually decided this morning, um, man, the David and Goliath story, it has a crescendo, doesn't it? has the height of action. How does the story end? Well, we all know how the story ends. Most of you know how the story will end. So I'm not going to read it to you. Because we're nowhere near the end of your story. You can play. Thank you. Graduates, you've got so much life ahead of you. So much is going to happen in your life. But I take, I have peace I have understanding that I know how your story ends. It ends in the arms of God. It ends in an internal kingdom. I know how your story ends. But it's also just beginning. And that's why I read just the beginning of a story because the perspective that David has in the beginning of that story impacts what happens in the end. And I'm telling you, your attitude and you understanding that you are not the servant of a man, you are not too young, You are not this big, but as big as the person that you belong to. You are cherished by God, and all victory comes from Him. But I would also ask you to remember, as you go about your life, as you start to answer questions that need answering, as you start to make plans, that you understand what David did when he fought the lion, the bear, and Goliath. Yes, he gave up on defeat, but he also gave up on the victory. It belonged to God. God gets the glory for all of our, all of our, all of our victories. And if we can live that way, if we can live as though God is the reason and the purpose for our every action, that we see victory when there is loss, when people see defeat and death, we see a resurrection, you're going to be better off. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for our graduates. We're going to pray for our parents because they're going to start stressing out and sweating and pulling their hair. And then after we're done praying, we'll do one more song, and then we've got a video of our graduates to honor them. Will you pray with me? Father, we recognize that in you, we win. That in you, we have victory. But it is only because of you. It's only because of who you are. Father, today I give up, and I'm praying that there are kids who with me will give up the right to claim their own victories, the right to live their own lives, but only live in your will. My prayer is that there is a generation being raised up right now in this weird moment in history, in this weird time, and they would see everything that's happening and realize just how in control you are, just how deep and wide your love is, just how much is in store for us so that when we see something scary, we don't honor it with fear. We only honor you with fear. And in that knowledge of who you are, we would live in peace and with joy for everything we do. We love you. We praise you. It's in your son's perfect name we pray. Amen.